In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, verse 21. Matthew 24, 21. Now here we're going to have a test of the emotional pattern of the disciples, actually the emotional pattern of everyone in the tribulation. And that's because, well, let's see here in 2421 what's going to occur. At that time there will be great persecution, unlike anything that has happened from the beginning of the world until now or will ever happen. So they're going to see a lot of uh, terrible things that have never happened before and will never happen afterwards. This will not affect us, thank God. We're in the church age and we won't have to deal with these things. But during the tribulation there's going to be uh, some terrible things that come down the pike that people are going to have to deal with. And instead of being emotional, they're going to have to uh, re rely on Bible doctrine. And Bible doctrine is the only thing that's going to get them through the situations that's going to occur during the tribulation. Nothing else will do it. Now what, what has happened here, they've all ran up into the high mountains. By this time they should have. And they should have all gone either uh, east or south into the Mead Mountains or the other mountains that are to the south and have a uh, made their homes there away from the population so that they will not be persecuted. If they would stay where they are, they would receive death. And they were killing all the Christians. <clears throat> then in 24, 22, And if those days had not been reduced in number, no one would be saved. And if those days had not been reduced in number, no one would be saved. You see, Satan has been cast out of heaven, and he is now doing his work solely on the earth. And while he's on the earth, he is going to go mad with violence. And he is going to start uh, killing many Christians and many Jews. And uh, our Lord himself must shorten the days so that Somebody could be saved. And those who will be saved are those who have believed in Christ, but not just those who have believed in Christ, because many of them won't be saved. It will be those who have believed in Christ and those who have gotten with the Word of God and listened. They will be the ones in the tribulation who will be saved. Now those who have believed in Christ will be saved and go to heaven when they die, but they may die during the tribulation. They may die uh, of some type of execution during the tribulation. Yet, if someone has believed in Christ and has grown in grace and in knowledge, they will not die, and because they will follow the instructions of the Lord exactly that are given in the tribulation. And the principle is, you must follow the Word of God. If not, you're going to be in a tight spot, period. So, 24-23 or to, what, 24, 22, if all, and, if, and, and if those days had not been reduced in number, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be reduced in number. The elect always refer to those who have believed in Christ, <clears throat> and that is true, that it is reduced uh, for the elect. It is also uh, greatly reduced for those who have uh, believed in Christ, and have 
learned the word of God, all of those would be part of the elect. Then in 24, 23. Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. And the problem is there's going to be a huge test of the emotional pattern in the tribulation because all these Christians are going to be up on the mountains. And they're going to be up there a while. And uh, they'll be fed by the logistical grace of God. We don't know how. The food might be scarce, so they might really uh, want to come back down the mountain. And what's going to happen is uh, a, a great propaganda mission. And there are going to be people down below who are going to send out uh, certain trucks with the great uh, megaphones coming out. And they will say, the Christ has come. Come down to see the Christ. Come down to see the Christ. And that's how they're trying to get him out of the mountains. They can't really find him all up in there. But they want to get him all out so they can kill him. They want to kill all the Christians. And they know all the Christians are hiding in the mountains. And instead of going up and getting them and picking them off one by one, they figure they'll do a propaganda mission and get them all down there at one time and just slaughter them. So they say, hey, the Christ is here. The Christ is calling for you. And they might even know some of the people's names. Hey, George, the Christ is calling for you, George. Come down, George. The Christ is here. He wants to see you. And there'll be a big emotional test on them because either they're going to follow the Word of God, and we'll see what the Word of God has to say. The Word of God has to say, stay right there. Do not move. Do not go. But if they follow their emotions and say, oh, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He's come to see me, and I'm going to run down that hill into His arms, and they're going to, they'll do it. Some of them will do that, and they'll run right into the arms of uh, killers, and they'll slaughter them because they acted on their emotions instead of listening to the Word of God or instead of uh, following and obeying. They may have even listened to it, but instead of obeying the Word of God. And what would they have to obey? Some of the things that are written here. 24-24 For false Christ and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So it's talking about leading astray those who have already believed in Christ. They've believed in Christ, but there's going to be such a propaganda ministry going on down in Israel that uh, they will actually get some of those who have believed in Christ to just run out of the mountains. Just run right down there because Jesus is there. And this is going to be a test of their emotions. Are they going to believe what the Word of God says? Are they going to obey the Word of God? Or, or are they going to say, I want to go see the Lord right now and run out of the mountain and be slaughtered? Many will run out of the mountain and be slaughtered. Some will stay behind. For false Christ, and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So the principle is to stick with the word. And the principle also is how you feel is inconsequential. And when the word of God speaks, all human discussion ceases. All of these people are going to be worried. Are the, they're either going to listen to the word of God. And they're, going to, they're either going to listen to 23, 24 and say, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. They're either going to do not believe him, or they're going to get emotional and say, Oh, they say the Christ is here. I believe it. I'm tired of being up in these mountains, and I'm going. And a lot of them will go. Based on emotion, based on the emotional revolt, they get sick of living in the mountains, which is understandable. It's cold. And sometimes it's rainy. The, the mountains in Israel, it's not too rainy. It's just uh, cold at night. In the winter time, it is rainy and snowy. It does snow in Israel. So if this is winter time, it's uh, going to be a miserable time for them. And they're, they're going to want to get out of the mountains as soon as possible. 
And as soon as the, someone comes along with a smooth line, boom, they go along with their feelings. There are so many applications that come out of this. Now, in the tribulation, these applications are life and death. They're a matter of life and death. Do you know if uh, these people say, if they say, yeah, I'm going to come out of the mountains because this fellow sounds pretty good and this fellow sounds like he might be the Christ and I'm going to follow him and I want to see my Lord and he just called my name and he loves me and they run out of the mountains, they die. And they die for operating on their feelings rather than operating on learning the Word of God and rather than knowing 2423. If anything, every person in the tribulation should have memorized Matthew 24, 23. It's going to be one of the most important verses for them to believe because during that time there's going to be great pressure for them to come out of the mountain. And if they follow their emotions, they will come out of the mountains. If they follow the Word of God, they'll simply sit there and say, No, Scripture tells me not to. Scripture says, Do not Believe him. And so the application to us even is if a young man says, I love you very much. I want to, uh, let's consummate this relationship. I love you so much. Let us now uh, have sexual relations. And you get emotional and you do it. You've not obeyed the Word of God, but you've followed your heart. And that's what everybody tells you to do today, isn't it? Just follow your heart. If your heart tells you to do this, do this. If your heart tells you to do that, do that. And your heart, what they mean by heart is emotion. They don't mean how you think. Nobody ever comes up to you and says, well, what do you think is best? So they always say, oh, just follow how you feel. Follow your heart. And if you like some studly guy and you follow the way you feel, you'll end up in a bad mess in which you have a baby on the way and he's done split. And you're left with an unwanted pregnancy. Emotion, see? Emotion took over. You had emotional revolt of the soul rather than knowing the Word of God. And if you knew the Word of God, you would read it and say, Hey, it says here, flee fornication. Run away from it. Have no part in fornication. But, if you're in emotional revolt of the soul, you'll say, well, he's so handsome, maybe we'll get married, and uh, he's well-meaning, and he, uh, by the way, he's even a Christian, and he's well-meaning, etc., and, uh, and this is how I feel, and I'm going to follow my heart. And therefore, you're following your emotions. Now, in the tribulation, you follow your emotions, you drop dead. In the church age, you follow your emotions, well, you'll be punished. Maybe you'll drop dead. Maybe you'll get AIDS. Maybe you'll get something else that will uh, slow you down in life. But, if you do not follow the Word of God, eventually all of us would die the sin face to face with death if we didn't follow the Word of God. If we continuously reject the Word of God, if we continuously have an emotional reaction to the Word of God, then eventually we'll all drop dead uh, from the sin face to face with death. Now, 24-5. 24-5. Remember, I have told you before. It's a simple phrase, but it's something that, uh, well, what we have in writing is this is the first time we've ever been hearing about this, isn't it, uh, in writing from Matthew. Uh, but the disciples had heard this before, and, other, and actually uh, the way it comes out in the Greek is they've heard it uh, almost an infinite number of times. He has taught them what's going to happen in the tribulation. And so when they keep asking these questions, it's probably pretty frustrating for the Lord, but they keep asking these questions as per before. Well, what's going to happen with the uh, temple? And then, well, what tell us, what are the signs of the tribulation? Yet, he says here, remember, I've told you before. 
our Lord has given this message, this same message concerning what is going to happen in the tribulation over and over and over again. And therefore, there comes the importance of repeating. I might not repeat enough so that you might not understand enough, but obviously these disciples needed repeating, 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 one after another, repetition, repetition, repetition. And after I get done with Matthew, I might go into some repetition, repetition, repetition concerning the basic doctrines because this should have been pretty basic for the disciples. And for them to be asking, what's going to happen in the tribulation when they had been told before, and not just once, many times before, there's something wrong with uh, their perception. Now, a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're not filled with God the Holy Spirit, and it's not their fault, because they can't be. They don't have that as of yet. Now, we have it, and we can be. And if we name our sins, we're filled with God the Holy Spirit. The disciples, it's not the day of Pentecost yet. On the day of Pentecost is when God the Holy Spirit comes down and indwells every believer. So all 120 believers on the day of Pentecost receive the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And we have the filling of God the Holy Spirit. If we're out of fellowship, we grieve, quench uh, God the Holy Spirit, and therefore we're out of fellowship and we work in the energy of the flesh. So they're outside of the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and their only means of learning these things is by faith perception. They have no extra power, no extra power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit as we have, so they are a lot more forgetful than what we would be if we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. If we're not filled with God the Holy Spirit, we'll be just as forgetful as the disciples, if not more so, because we would be uh, neglectful and we would... If we weren't filled with the Spirit, we would eventuate in rejecting the whole spiritual life. So we've just dealt with the signs that occur in the tribulation. And we deal with something here, 2425. Remember, I've told you before, we deal with something in which uh, there's been a lot of repetition, yet they don't remember. Then in 2426. So then. If someone says to you, Look, he is in the wilderness. Do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. So this is this is our uh, this is the passage telling them uh, you're going to hear a lot of propaganda in the tribulation. You're going to hear that the Lord has returned, and you're going to hear that uh, look. He's in the wilderness, just at the bottom of the mountain. And all you need to do is run down to Him and throw your arms open, and the Lord is ready for you. Jesus Christ is at the bottom of the mountain. And they may even know some of the names of the people on top of the mountain. And they'll say it. And instead of following what Scripture says, they'll get very emotional and start running down the mountain. And when they do, they'll be met with a shot right through the head, and they'll die. They'll kill them. They're trying to pull them out of the mountains to kill them because there's a great persecution of Christians. Or he's in the inner rooms. He's in the cities, in the inner rooms, or in the temple in the inner rooms, and you must go down there and see him, and before you even get close to there, you're dead. So in the tribulation, following the word of God becomes a matter of life and death. In the tribulation, if you do not follow 2426, you'll end up dead. So then if someone says to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If you do go out, you die. It's an intensified stage of the angelic conflict. And what it's going to come down to in the tribulation is either you're going to accept the word of God or you're going to reject it. If you reject it, you're going to die. Now, today it's the same. It's the same, it's just drawn out. We don't have a short seven-year period. Some of us may live to be 60, 70, or 80. Maybe a lot younger. It doesn't really matter. God's already determined that. But we have a longer time to live on 
the earth, and if we disobey here and there, it doesn't mean immediate death. But in the tribulation, if you disobey these very specific orders of the Lord, it means immediate death. So you might think of it as getting away with a lot more today. But we don't because we're punished. While we may not be punished in death, we're punished in all sorts of ways. And if we do not follow the Word of God and follow His mandates, and if we do not to follow what the Word of God says in telling us what to do, uh, for example, uh, the Word of God says flee fornication. Do not fornicate. Now, now, in the tribulation, it says, do not go out. They don't really have much time for fornicating, although it will occur. But it says, do not go out. And if you go out, you die. So here's a case we can say, uh, do not fornicate for us here in the church age. Do not fornicate. If you, you, I hope you know what fornication is. It means sex outside of marriage. Sex before you get married. And if you have sex before you get married, you'll be punished. And you may die with all the diseases out there. You would be taking a very big risk to even think about it. And uh, there's all types of things, AIDS, herpes, all types of things to make your life miserable or to even cut your life short. And why? Because you disobeyed the Word of God. Do you think that AIDS is around here or that herpes is around here just uh, floating around as if God had nothing to do with it? Of course he did. It's a punishment because people did not follow his word. Now remember the big AIDS scare in the 80s and everybody was scared. And back then it was mostly for homosexuals. It still is today, but it has spread into the heterosexual community so that if you fornicate, you may get AIDS. Probably not, but you may. If you have homosexual relationships, uh, you probably will get AIDS eventually if you continue in that. But what we have from this is the fact that uh, God punishes. You don't follow what he does, he's going to punish you. You may end up sick, you may end up dead. And it's no different in the tribulation, except it has been brought into a more confined situation into which it's going to happen pretty quick. If you run down that mountain, you're probably going to die five minutes later. And so that's because of the intensity of the situation. Now in 2427, we go to the signs of the second advent. The signs of the second advent means the signs of the second coming. The signs of our Lord Jesus Christ who is going to come down and set foot on the Mount of Olives. And all these signs are given in Matthew. They are also given in Revelation. All throughout Scripture, uh, these things are given for the tribulational saints and for us to make application. But the tribulational saints will be able to go straight to these passages and say, this is exactly what I must do. Go to the mountain. Stay on the mountain. Wait on the mountain until the Lord comes. And then they say, well, how do I know when the Lord is coming? And then there's an answer in 2427. For as the lightning, lightning is used because it travels with great speed. Lightning can be seen by everyone. The second coming of Christ will be seen by everyone. The first advent of Christ was seen by a few. The second advent of Christ is going to be seen by everyone. It travels at great speed. It can be seen by everyone. This is also mentioned in Revelation chapter 1 verse 7. Lightning also, of course, warns of a coming storm. If you ever see lightning, it warns of a coming storm. And this lightning in this age will be a warning of the coming of the baptism of fire. Or the baptism of fire judgment. It's about to come. So instead of running down the mountain, they should know some doctrine. If they had known doctrine, if they had known 2427, they would know that the Lord's not going to come in a vehicle with a thing taped to his lips saying, Come down. I'm here. I love you. Everyone come down. That's not how he's going to do it. He's going to come streaking across the sky like lightning. And if they had read 2427, they would have known it. If they would accepted the word of God instead of gotten emotional, they would have known it. 
What's going to happen is a lot of them aren't going to, a lot of them are going to read this, and they're still not going to accept the Word of God. And uh, a lot of the people at the bottom of the hill are going to say, uh, Jesus loves you very much, and He wants you to come down. And a lot of people are going to get emotional and say, Praise Jesus, and run down the hill with their hands waving toward heaven. I can see all those people on television just running down the hill. What I'm talking about is the Pentecostal movement. Praise Jesus, He's here. And just run down the hill. I'm coming to see Jesus. And then they get slaughtered. What they need to do is follow the Word of God. But many of them might not even know it. And that's the tragedy of the situation then and now. So in 24:27, For as the lightning, which travels with great speed, and it can be seen by everyone. That's found in Revelation 1.7. And it warns of a coming storm. That would be the baptism of fire. And also lightning disturbs and frightens people. It doesn't disturb and frighten me. I love to watch it. But uh, for most people, I, I guess I'm crazy. But for most people, it disturbs and frightens them. And that is found in Revelation chapter 6, 15-17. During a thunderstorm, I love to just sit out on the front porch and watch. And watch the lightning zoom all across the sky, straight down, sideways, cloud to cloud, cloud to ground. Now, I'll tell you, if it gets a little too close, I'll walk inside. I'm not going to be an idiot. Uh, but uh, usually, uh, but it doesn't really matter because uh, lightning, if it's striking 100 miles out, it can take a curve for 100 miles and hit you without you even knowing a storm was nearby. I've seen that on the television. I've never seen it firsthand, but I saw it on some channel talking about lightning. And the, the sky was pretty clear, but on the other side of the mountain was a thunderstorm, and this guy was bike riding. And since it was on the other side of the mountain in Colorado, he couldn't even see the clouds, because mountains are high out there. And the lightning bolt just jumped over the mountain and popped him on the head, and he fell over. He didn't die, but uh, he had holes all through his body, and it was very painful. And, but he didn't even know there was a storm. He wasn't being an idiot. But in any case, lightning frightens people, and it should because uh, lightning deaths are quite prevalent. It disturbs and frightens people, and that's found in Revelation 6, 15 through 17. So for as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, that is the way of the coming the son of the Son of Man will be. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, that is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. In other words, it's going to be quick, fast, like lightning. And he's uh, going to come from the east and shoot west. Now this isn't, remember, this isn't the resurrection. We're dealing with the second advent. In the resurrection, Jesus Christ simply comes down in the clouds. And we'll meet the Lord in the air in the clouds to be with Him forever. And none of this of flashiness. Now, of course, there'll be a trumpet sounded, but the only people who can hear the trumpet are the believers. The unbelievers aren't going to hear that trumpet. We are. And if the resurrection occurs at 10 o'clock tonight, or let's say at 3 in the morning, the trumpet will sound and... You, it would probably wake you up and then zap up into heaven you go to be with the Lord forever. And then you'll be evaluated and have fun doing that. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to have fun doing it either, but we're all going to have to go through the evaluation. So then in uh, 24, 28, wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will be gathered. In other words, when the uh, Son of Man comes flashing from east to west, that will be the Son of God coming and placing His foot on the earth. And He will kill all the enemies of Israel. Wipe them out. Immediately kill them. And that's when blood will run as high as the horse's bridle. And carcasses will be everywhere, strewn everywhere. The only thing he has to do is appear, and boom, they're all dead. So wherever the carcass is, 
there the vultures will be gathered. So the vultures will be right there ready to clean up after our Lord. They're like the little maids. He's just wiped out all the evil people on the earth. The little maids, the vultures are going to come along and eat them up. It's going to be a wonderful sight. And this part we will get to see because we will follow the Lord uh, into the millennium. We'll be behind Him. And those of us who are winners will be right up in the first line. And we'll get to see Him shooting out great lightning bolts and just going, and they're all dead, and then the mountain splits in two. We'll get to see it all, and we'll get to see the vultures come down and eat up all the flesh. It's going to be fun. We'll all be there to see it. You'll see it too. And when we're in heaven, you'll say, Hey, man, you said that was going to happen. Yep, it's right here in the Bible. It was going to happen. And we're all going to see it. And all the, the, the vultures are going to down and eat the flesh of all the people who were evil, who did not believe in Christ. 24-29 Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not reflect its light. The meteors will fall from, from, from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and all the tribes of the land will cry tears of joy. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I'm going to cut it short here today, and we will continue tomorrow with all... With, what does that all mean, 24-9 and 24-30? Well, we'll see tomorrow. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.